Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see you. My name is Dustin Cormier, and this is How to Rock Astrology. Today, we're going to be continuing our reading of Light on Life by Robert E. Svidoba and Hart DeFau. We are now on Chapter 4, having a discussion on the Grahas, or the planets. This is a continuation of a playlist. If you want to see the rest of the playlist, uh, look up this reading of light on life in my channel so thank you for coming today ladies and gentlemen the authors of the book start off this chapter on the grahas by doing a nice and formal sort of non-astronomical philosophical epithet and that's what this episode is going to be it's talking about the language of Jyotish it's going to give us a deeper insight into what Josh e, uh, Jyotish is and how to apply it, what it is as a tool, and how we can be a tool for it as a Vedanga of the Veda, of truth. <coughs> Chapter 4, the Grahas, or the planets. <coughs> the language of Jyotish. Only the Jyotishi who has augmented reasoning with experience and cultivated a sharp intuition can select the astrological principle that is most appropriate for a situation in prediction. Jyotish, which is a sort of language, offers a variety of words and a series of basic rules which dictate when, where, and how those words may be used. While an effective communicator may intuitively know when logical rules of word selection can be broken, this sort of intuition works only when the communicator is well versed in the rules of language. The words of the language of Jyotish are the planets, the constellations, and the houses, the main three. Anyone who sets out to learn a new idiom must follow the tedious but unavoidable procedure of acquiring a basic vocabulary by memorizing lines of words and their meanings. The next three chapters of this book <clears throat> form a comprehensive vocabulary which must be memorized by anyone who hopes to become proficient in the language of Jyotish. Because Jyotish is classically taught by proceeding from the specific to the abstract. And the authors of this book do it in an, in a, an enjoyable way. So as we go along, we'll be able to enjoy getting these gestalt impressions of the energy agency that is the Grahas planets, as well as the constellations and the houses, eventually. Jyotish is classically taught by proceeding from the specific to the abstract. First the student learns specific examples, then the mentor helps the student to see the theory from which those examples have originated. When you learn specifics first, you rarely, if ever, forget them. The specifics will then unfailingly remind you of their underlying principles. So you remember the story, you remember the analogy, the anagram, the ideogram. Most times, you know, people say in any language, the only way to really burn a word into your brain is to go and sit at the table and knead water and look all around and just desperately find some way to connect with agua, Spanish, uh, agua, find it somewhere and then you get it and you remember the moment when you got your first water drinking and using that word. It's connected to a real world, physical, specific example and experience. First you learn specific examples. When you learn specifics first, 
you rarely, if ever, forget them. The specifics will then unfailingly remind you of their underlying principles. I just wanted to repeat that. Now, many people who study Jyotish try to take shortcuts by learning just enough of the Jyotish vocabulary <clears throat> they believe to be essential. I see, sorry, let me rephrase that again. Many people who study Jyotish try to take shortcuts by learning just enough of the Jyotish vocabulary they believe to be essential and then trying to fill in the gaps with their knowledge of Western astrology. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Such haphazard learning cannot prepare you adequately to speak in Jyotish, Jyotish's idiom any more than you could carry on an intelligible conversation in grammatical French if you chose to learn only a French, a fraction of French vocabulary and elected to substitute English words for everything you had not bothered to absorb. That's an awesome metaphor. It's like if you try to just learn only the bit, a little bit of Jyotish and then you use Western language to fill in those gaps without really learning the deep roots of the Jyotish vocabulary that comes from Sanskrit. Then it's just like, you know, you trying to speak French only knowing a limited amount and then replacing the words you don't know with English. People still aren't going to fully, the concepts aren't fully going to come through. Therefore, the intelligence and awareness aren't going to come through. The result might be original, but it would also be unintelligible. Remember this Sanskrit proverb. Knowledge that has not been memorized is as useless in a time of need as money that was lent but never repaid. Hmm. <clears throat> now, this next part is called Jyotishan translation. All interpreters often face difficulties and ambiguities in interpretation. And this is particularly true of astrologers who assume the role of interpreter for those who do not understand astrological jargon. It's the classic frustration of any astrologer who's had to deal with a client whom doesn't have the deepest grasp of the symbols of astrology. <clears throat> it's like trying to be a psychological counselor to a person who you don't speak the language of. Like, how do you get, get through? Just as a well-trained interpreter must sometimes take liberties with language in order to, pres to preserve its meaning. A good Jyotishi must become proficient at resolving astrological idiomatic expressions and ambiguities in order to translate precisely astrological st statements during a consultation. To translate the French expression mon petit chou, chow into English as my little cabbage is literally correct, but such a literal rending is absurd, for mon petit chow is an idiomatic expression which means my dear or my darling. Honey may, however, be a good translation for mon petit cho, even though cabbage does not mean honey. Hmm. Because of inherent ambiguities in everyday speech, even people who are not professional translators must translate within their native language much, much of the time. When someone tells you to hit the nail with the hammer, you probably will not slug away at your fingernail because you understand that a different sort of nail is indicated. When you hear the phrase bullseye, you are not likely to visualize a, bo or a bovine organ of sight because your previous experience of the phrase helps you interpret it differently and appropriately. Proficiency in any language comes through experience but 
by, comp by comparing the many translations of the Bible, you will discover that differences of opinion can and do arise, and even among experienced translators. Several English possibilities exist for each of the most vital Greek or Hebrew words in critical passages, and each variant interpretation is sanctioned by a rival group of reputable scholars. This is precisely the situation among groups of Jyotishis when they debate pithy astrological statements. For, in the words of the Vedas, the truth is one. The learned speak of, speak of it in many ways. On rare occasions, these translations may even oppose one another. Such differences of interpretation do not invalidate Jyotish any more than differences of interpretation invalidate biblical scholarship. For the, the majority of Jyotishis share a consensus about their scriptures that is similar to the consensus shared about the Bible. Scholars of the Bible, that is. Differences of interpretation occur in every symbolic language because the symbol itself no matter how perfect, can never be precisely the thing that it symbolizes. The words we use to describe the planets, constellations, and houses are decidedly poor substitutes for the things they represent. Even the word symbol is subject to varying interpretations. The cosmic events we view in the sky are real, and they are also symbolic. Although many people, particularly Westerners, take as unreal the mythic symbols which represent these events, Jyotish treats them as being real both independently and dependently. They are dependently real in that they can remain alive on the material plane only so long as humans continue to remember them. So it's like only the only way that God, the gods, the mythos, the archetypes of, you know, the neurogenetic archetypes of human expression, these can only exist if there are humans to imagine them. Yet they are independently real and that they do not re require humans in order to continue to live. They need humans in order to express their livingness, but they will perpetuate themselves in the continuum of non-existence until there are humans who can conceive them and bring light, the light of awareness through the compendium that is those gods and those deities and those myths in us collectively. Those who study Indian vidyas do not study symbols. They create relationships with them. Our introduction to the planets can be divided into three parts, aspects, strengths, and characteristics. And that leads us to our next page, uh, to our next chapter in this book. Uh, well, not next chapter, but the next part of chapter four. So I hope you guys are enjoying going through this with me. I'm going to cut this off for now. I'm Dustin Cormier for How to Rock, Astro uh, How to Rock Astrology. Stay tuned. On the next episode, we're going to be delving into... Uh, a little bit more of the meat and potatoes and the bones of astrological planetary graha interpretation. Starting with planetary associations and aspects. We haven't heard much about what the planets actually are and what they mean and what they represent and what they symbolize just yet. Uh, for now, we're just going to be talking about their aspects, and that's going to be coming up in the next video. Thanks for watching, folks. See you on the next one.